So today's webinar is on litter, not always a waste, and it'll be presented by Elaine Doyle. So Elaine has been working as an engineer for the last 10 years. She's a director at EWB Ireland and currently the Coastal Programs Officer at Antashka. So we're delighted to have her on the webinar. Um, just before I hand you over to Elaine, I want to mention that we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask Elaine, just message in the chat letting us know you have a question. And once Elaine has finished your presentation, we'll start the Q&A. Okay, thanks. I'll pass you over to Elaine now. Hi, how are you doing? So, welcome. Uh, apologies for my I meant to clean up my room and if any children appear I own them so just so you know one or two might appear during the webinar but we're trying to minimize that so I'm here today to talk to you about letter and you might be wondering that when I was asked would I like to do a webinar and what would I talk about why litter would be the first thing that would come into my head but I'm going to challenge myself to hopefully have you thinking a little bit differently about litter as we go through this webinar. So a little bit about me, Aoife would uh, introduce me there. My name is Elaine Doyle. I've been involved with Engineers at Our Borders since I think around 2012, it got um, re-established around that time. I was involved in the National Committee then and I'm now also on the Board of Directors. So I started off my uh, education career as an engineer. I studied manufacturing engineering and I really love production, production process, how materials become products, the, the life cycle of materials. And it was something I was always really interested in. And my first job through college was in the semiconductor industry, which is hyper, hyper, hyper clean. And then I took a little step down and I went to the biomedical industry, which again is hyper clean. But while I was there, I was thinking, no, there's something more for me. And I was bright eyed and bushy tailed. I was 23. And I said, I need to, need to find my place in the world. And I went into the environmental sector. Truthfully, I did want to get into clean energy, but I said I'd go in whatever way I could. And I ended up in waste and I haven't left. So I literally ended up working in waste because I was in a waste management company, which is basically college talk for a dump and it was actually until it was until I'd left that job there was there was a particular smell at, at the job that I didn't think about when I was there and it was just there was a smell in the air it was kind of sweet it wasn't overly pleasant but didn't pay any attention to it and now anytime a bin lorry passes me it brings me back to my time working there so it did smell like a large bin and it taught me an awful lot about the waste industry and then I ended up working in, I've worked in food waste and the reimagining and redistribution of food as food or food and looking at it as food waste or looking at it as raw material. And I currently work with Clean Coasts, which is part of the Antashka Environmental Education Unit. So when you say you work on anything to do with coasts, people think that's really, really cool and that you're out on the beach and it's all very surfy and wonderful. So it is, it is a great job and it is lovely that we do get to associate ourselves with the beach, but I'm kept inside a lot for one reason. I live in North Cork and the other is I work in a program called Think Before You Flush, which doesn't have the same kind of cool points as Clean Coast does. But I'll chat to you in a minute about the where waste comes from. So in Think Before You Flush, what I'm looking at is the waste that's put down the toilet not including human waste, how that can end up on the beach and how basically we are all connected from our homes to the sea, to the ocean. Ties in very well with we're engineers at our borders. We don't have borders as people. We are all very connected within our ecosystem. So gonna look at litter. Where did litter come from? It wasn't really always the thing. It was there, but it wasn't really always a problem. So very, very early days there, there was no such thing as letter because there wasn't packaging and everything was reused and even any of you lucky enough to have grandparents or relatives that were that are still alive that would have been around during the war there was very little waste created people couldn't afford to have waste they had less stuff they needed less stuff but something 
there was a major shift, especially after the war. And a lot of this would have been in the 50s in the UK and the US. It, it would have come to Ireland a little later. But the belief that now we needed more stuff. After the war, people were told newer, better. Everything needs to be newer and go buy, 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 buy. Let's get us out of recession, get the economy back. To get people to buy more, they need to, they need to understand, well, they need to not understand the difference between their needs and their wants. They need to think that their uh, wants are needs. And the advertising industry played a lot into that. So I know it's fictional, but if you look at the likes of Mad Men, it's making everything cool and sexy and you want to be the people in the ads. So advertising became very strong around that time and people wanted stuff. Convenience was another area of it. So it was looking at mainly for housewives who would have done a lot of the work, let's make your life easier. The idea of, you'd see on TV programs, the TV dinner, people sit down, the food is in all these little containers in a plastic container. It means the, the woman has less washing up to do, wonderful convenience, but there wasn't a thought about the waste. The biggest convenient product of all, sliced bread. Now you no longer have to make bread and cut it with a knife. Get sliced bread. This is the best thing since sliced bread. We still say that, but it was covered in plastic. So the idea of this waste, it became a thing because the more convenient we wanted our lifestyle to be, the more waste we were creating. Another was planned obsolescence and perceived obsolescence. So planned obsolescence is products that finish their, their life before they're needed. Either sometimes it's for safety reasons, sometimes it's for reselling reasons, or other time, especially at the moment we know this with phones, it's because something new comes out. Phones and cars. Phones and cars change every year. They don't change. Nothing happens to them. They upgrade a little. And now there's a status involved if you get a better one. I got an email from three last week saying I was due an upgrade. And I was very excited going, yeah, now I get a new phone. I don't need a new phone. I have a perfectly good phone, but will I get one? Very probably. Why? Because it's free and because I'll get it. And when I get it, I'll show other people, did you see my new phone? It's brilliant. It does lots of wonderful things. And we want new. We want better. We want fancier. And that has led to a whole pile of waste. And waste wasn't really seen as much of a problem till after the war, because the more our lives become more convenient, which is wonderful, more waste has been created. And there's not a lot of places to put these waste, to put this waste. In Ireland, we bury it in the ground, but we're running out of space to do that. We have an incinerator, there's a lot of controversy over that, but people hate the idea of burning our waste. But where do we put it? When I worked in waste management, I worked in recycling, and recycling is often seen as, wow, this recycling is brilliant. Recycling is great, but if you look at the, the ladder of waste, the worst thing you could do is throw it on the ground. One step up from that is putting it in the black bin because it's going to end up in landfill. One step up from that is recycling. While recycling is great, it's not the be all and end all because it's very energy intensive. The recycling company, when I worked there, things might have changed a little, but this was 2005. The trucks had come in with the waste from your blue bin. And the way we work in the West, we, we put our waste away and we segregate it and we're great. We don't want to think about it anymore. If you ever forget to put out your bin or if you get your timings mixed up, it's always a bit of a nightmare that you're holding on to this waste for another week and you feel, what am I going to do with it? Because we don't want to think about it. We need someone else to handle that. In the waste management company I worked in, the waste was put onto a conveyor belt and people had to literally pick through the waste. What were they picking through? You know, the, sometimes there's a yogurt pot and you don't clean it out fully and you still drop it in. That has to get picked out so there's not cross-contamination. Maybe somebody put something wrong in the recycle bin by mistake and they didn't really want to go through it to fix it. That has to be picked out. This has been picked out by hand. I don't know if it's still done that way, but this was low skilled work. It wasn't work anybody wanted to do, but it was the system we had. Then when we had the clean waste at the end, it was packed up and sent in large shipping containers to India and China to be processed. So again, 
getting rid of the problem. We don't want to think about it. So I had worked here in 2005 and then I was uh, living in Ghana in, 2000, in summer 2006 in a forest park in the north. It was like really, really in the middle of nowhere. It was this really, really amazing place. You could do walking safaris, but it was in the middle of nowhere and they had seen my CV. So when I arrived, they said, oh, we need you to help us with our waste. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm a good swimmer, but I was out of my depth. I was saying, okay, I have no idea what you're going to want me to do, but let me, let me try and help. So they brought me down to where they processed the waste. Waste was collected from the village, brought down to a field and burnt. It wouldn't have been burnt fully, so the kind of charred remains were buried in the ground. Elephants, warthogs and monkeys would come along, dig up some of these charred remains and spread the waste around the place. So I'm standing there going, oh my God, I have no idea what to do. And they said, so you work in waste management. Can you tell us what happens in your country? And maybe we could do the same here. And we hear a lot at the moment about people saying, check your privilege. And it's when I had to say the words, I realized, wow, the system we have, as much as we give out, is amazing. I said, I live in a house. I put my waste in this large bin with wheels on it. I roll it out to the gate and a man in a van collects it. I said, I used to work in a company where they separated the waste. Some of it goes to a big hole in the ground and some of it we send halfway around the world for other people to deal with it. And I could just see them looking at me saying, well, you're obviously going to be no help to us, but just amazed about how our system is that we don't deal with our own waste. And this was 2006. So at the time, obviously, and still now, backyard burning was very much frowned upon. So I was advising things I never thought I'd ever say to anyone. I was saying to them, when you're burning the rubbish, because there was nothing else to do with it, make sure your faces are covered, check which way the wind is blowing, that the wind, that the fumes won't blow into the village. Uh, I tried to look at ways that we could keep the animals away from the waste, but that was something that, that was really difficult. We tried different coverings. But while we in this country can get away with being a little bit snobby about waste when you have to deal with your own waste it's hugely different and i also worked in guatemala and while i was there we looked at a waste project as well so there was waste i worked in a an eco park and there was a restaurant there as well and they wanted tourists to come to it it was on the trans-american highway and they were saying if we could get tourists like ye meaning white people to stop, you know, they'll, they'll spend some money. And this is now with really, really bad Spanish, but they were just talking about, oh, we know ye like it to be clean. And relies very strongly about people's misunderstanding about waste. Waste isn't just something that people don't like to see because it's a bit ugly. It has a huge impact on health. So that was something that we had to try and get through to people because one of the problems was there was no covers on the bins. Really simple. There was just no lid on the bin. And a lot of the dogs in the area were wild and people had picnics. So the dog would jump into the bin, take the food out, spread it everywhere. And a lot of the locals didn't kind of think about it. It was a bit annoying, but it wasn't a big deal. Whereas when we were trying to explain that it's not that it just doesn't look nice, this has an impact on the water system. The water system is Fair enough, people didn't drink the water in the area, but that was one of the reasons because the water was contaminated. And as part of our trip, when we were there, there was an Argentinian guy brought us to this old, um, it was an old tannery. So an area that they would have dealt with leather and co colored leather. And it wasn't the most environmentally friendly process and there wasn't proper facilitation for the waste because it, there wasn't the money for it and it just wasn't thought about, but there, used, there was a river right beside where the tannery was. So when they were finished dyeing the products, any of the waste went straight into the water. Now this tannery was closed by the time I was there and the water looked manky. And I was trying to think maybe the water isn't dirty. Sometimes water looks dirty because of, um, because of the location, because of the minerals in the area, but this water looked sad. And the Argentinian guy that was with us, he told us that this water was completely contaminated. The tannery had been closed for quite a number of years. But what was so sad was there was two boys playing in the water. 
any of you li that live near a water body, of course, that's what kids do. They go and play in water. And here we can do that knowing that 90% of the time is going to be safe. These little boys were playing in water that not only looked awful, there's obviously some going into their mouths, they were bathing in it, but we also found that this river no longer could sustain um, marine life. No fish live there anymore. And I know I've swam down the Lee and the kind of fish that swim in the Lee would probably live anywhere, but there was no fish could actually live here anymore because it was so contaminated. So just my long winded story there about how our attitudes to waste can be very different in different countries. And it's the understanding of our connection and our connection to nature and how the waste that we're creating has a huge impact on the world around us. But often, and there, there's the old thing of saying there is no way, and what really pointed that out to me was when I was in Ghana and when I was in Guatemala going, there is no way because people are dealing with their own waste and there's massive consequences to that. There was another area in Guatemala we were in, it was on the beach, it was um, by El Salvador. And again, there was nowhere to put the waste. So it just used to sit on the beach. And if waste sits on the beach, you get a lot of animals and you get a lot of vermin, you get a lot of disease, and you're also living in a country that doesn't have great medical um, facilities. So there's an awful lot of run on problems. But there was an English girl running a project there. And one of the things she did was, it's really hard to avoid having waste. So like in every country in the world, especially developing countries, it was easier to get a bottle of Coke than a bottle of water. Any of bottles like that, especially a two litre bottle, she used to put waste inside in it, not, um, not biodegradable waste, not food waste, packaging waste, clean it and put it into the bottle and use a stick and just smash it down as much as she could, make it as small as she could. So at the end, when the bottle was full, there was nowhere to put it, but at least it really minimized the amount of waste that she was using. Again, she was saying, this is something there's no way she should have been doing in the UK because the man in the van would take it away and we wouldn't have to think about it. Um, so waste in the development context is very interesting. And you often hear people when they come back from other countries going, God, that country was filthy. Do people have no regard for waste? But as I was saying, waste is quite new. Waste is something that was developed because of an entire system. And I know when I was in um, Australia, someone had, it was, this was a, in the middle of the country, sorry, in Alice Springs, and it was a white guy that was telling me, he said a lot of people believe that, the, that a lot of the Aboriginals had no regard for waste, had no, in, you know, they created waste, they had no regard for material possessions. But that's because a lot of the older people, they didn't grow up with material possessions and they never had this creation of waste and they didn't know what to do with it or how to deal with it. And then from the outside point of view, it looked like, God, they're kind of dirty. They're just throwing stuff around the place. From their point of view, they were like, what is this thing? We've never seen, you know, we've, we haven't had this much stuff or this much packaging, don't know what to do with it. So it might've just sat in the front garden. So there is a big disconnect there with our understanding of waste, especially within different cultures and are dealing with waste. And there's a lot can be said about if you look at people's waste, not suggesting go through people's bins. I was listening to a podcast recently with Richard Branson and he said people had gone through his bins looking for uh, dirt about him in a thing, nightclubs he used to run years ago. So I'm not talking about that, that's highly illegal. But this is what county council workers often have to do when there's illegal dumping in Ireland. I live out the country and down our road, somebody had thrown two bags of rubbish. And the agreement with the council is, if it's thrown on someone's land, it's their responsibility. If it's thrown on the road, it's the council's responsibility. So somebody had to come out. This is not what you want to be facing into on a Monday morning. Somebody had to come out and he had to go through the rubbish. And there's also a lot of reasons why people dump. Not all of it is selfish. Some of it is for monetary reasons. It doesn't excuse it, but it does give a bit more of an understanding. But he went through the rubbish. And my mother was walking and she said, um, she was just thanking him for, for what he was doing. And he said, found something very interesting. There's expensive face cream in this bag. This person can 
um, afford bin charges. So then they can decide on their dealing with the person when they literally go back to them with the waste. And a lot of people throw out a lot of clues about themselves, probably their address, and it can be traced back to them. So illegal dumping can work in that way that someone's rubbish actually gets delivered back to them, which is amazing that can be done because that person made the decision to put a bag in the back of their car and drive down a country road in the middle of the night to get rid of it because they didn't want to pay for the bin charges. And that is something that is being done in Ireland. And it really brings you back then to the responsibility around waste. So when I said I work with clean coasts, we work with tens of thousands of volunteers who go out and pick up litter uh, around the country, mainly on the coast, but we work in inland waterways as well. They're not picking up their own litter. They've thrown that away at home. They're choosing to go and pick up other people's litter, which is a really interesting thing to do. If your neighbor has a wall that needs painting, you can't go and paint their wall. That would be incredibly aggressive to do. Whereas if your neighbor left waste outside the front of their house, you may go and pick it up because you feel it is your duty to keep the area clean, even though it's not your waste. And the area of responsibility comes up a lot. So I was doing a beach clean in on the Bray Promenade a few years ago on a Tuesday of the East, Tuesday after the Easter Bank holiday. It was with a corporate group. And when we met up afterwards, I said, what kind of waste did you find? So let's profile the people who walked here today. So we found a lot of cigarette butts. So we said, okay, a lot of people were out walking, having a cigarette, threw the butt on the ground. They got what they wanted. They had a lovely walk. They had a smoke. They were nice and relaxed. But they threw the butt down on the ground for us to pick it up because they didn't think about who needed to pick this up. And there was lots of spoons for, and ice cream cartons. And then that opened the conversation of, I was saying, well, what kind of people were here this weekend? And they said, a lot of families. It was a nice day, weather was good, or a nice weekend, the weather was good. A lot of people ate ice cream, but they used, fair enough, the paper containers, but they do have plastic in them, so they can't be recycled, and plastic spoons. So I challenged the group and I said, well, what could we do instead of complaining that this waste is here, instead of coming out every week to fix it, what could we do about it? And they said, we should go to all the um, companies that are around and we should tell them that they're not to have plastic spoons. And that is one option. If the ice cream companies didn't have plastic spoons, we wouldn't have found plastic spoons. But where the responsibility comes in is, is the fault, does the fault lie with the company who provided you with the plastic spoon or does the fault lie with the person who threw the spoon on the ground? And this happens a huge amount on our beach cleans. A lot of the time in beach cleans, we find very much uh, plastic bottles and cigarette butts are the two big things. And the plastic bottles are usually owned by the Coca-Cola company. And I think they have Coke, Fanta, 7-Up and some of the water companies. And it comes up an awful lot that people are saying, well, it's their fault that these bottles are on the ground. But, and I'm not gonna answer the question, but I'm just gonna push it to you today to say, who, what, where do you think the blame lies? And not to be pointing blame, but as engineers and, and in resilience and looking at a post-COVID life, what do we want to see? Do we want to see the responsibility lying with people to not be littering? Or should the responsibility rely with the manufacturer to create a, to create a product that we can dispose of e easier? The answer is probably both but it's just something to get you thinking because a lot of the time when it comes to litter, people don't take responsibility and like to pass the blame. And as I said, when the project I work in is called Think Before You Flush, and it's about wipes. So um, one of the major problems is wipes. Wipes that are flushed down the toilet can end up on the beach. I've done a lot of beach cleans and people have said, who flushed wipes down the, who, or who threw these wipes here? It's disgusting. Who came out of their way to throw wipes on the beach? Yet you have to look at every person in the group and say, has any of you flushed a wipe down the toilet? That's where it can end up because we are all connected and our atmosphere is all connected to each other. And there's a very interesting thing happening at the moment concerning wipes, because this is something I look at a lot. Because of the atmosphere we live in at the moment, everyone is hyper 
worried about germs and they should be and that's really important and much more people are using disinfectant wipes in their homes to clean their homes because they want to keep their homes clean and they want to keep their families safe that's incredibly important however they now have this wipe and they're thinking jesus there could be COVID on this i need to get rid of this it can't be in my house I don't even want it in my bin, I want it gone. And it has been found an awful lot more being flushed down the toilet. When they flush down the toilet, the person can say, well, that's gone, it's out of my house and now I'm free because people are living in a state of fear at the moment. However, the onset of that is there's detergent in this wipe, there's plastic in this wipe, it's leaching into the system, it's going into our water system um, where so marine life can be eating it. We are eating some of this marine life, such as fish. We are drinking some of this water because it's treated to come out of our taps. And we're finding this waste on the beach as marine leisure. And things are a little different at the moment because people are thinking a little bit differently and maybe more internally and more about their homes, which is very important. But I think as we're coming out of the scarier part of COVID, it's a good time to reflect about what we want this post-COVID life to look like and where the responsibility we can take. So something I'm going to leave you with is that waste is also a bit of a state of mind. As I said, it was something we kind of created. We don't need, but we all have. So some people look at waste and very much from the engineering point, they don't see it as waste, they see it as a raw material. It's something that can be reused. Uh, and there's going to be a webinar in a couple of weeks about biochar. Biochar is made from waste materials, from waste food, from uh, waste cellulose material. Something that someone else might see as waste and throw away, we can now close the circle on it and make it into a new product. I had taken it off, I had a cardigan on earlier, that um, it's made of a wetsuit. So I don't do a lot of water activities, but anytime I do and wear a wetsuit, I don't want it to have holes in it. I want it to do what it needs to do. When a wetsuit gets a hole in it, it can be patched. When it's been threadbare, it's not useful anymore. If you can't recycle it, what are you gonna do with it? So as I said, waste is a bit of a state of mind. It can be made into something else. So now I have a waterproof jacket. I also have a handbag made out of um, a wetsuit as well. But there are many people that are looking at the uh, looking at it's not just post COVID because they were doing this anyway, but looking that waste is a bit of a state of mind and maybe they can reuse it and upcycle is the term and do something else with it. But I'll leave you with something that you do already know, but it's just to get it back into your heads. When we say reduce, reuse, recycle, it's not on a line, it's on a ladder. So recycle is the bottom. Reducing or reusing is the next best thing you could do. Reducing is one of the top things you can do. Rotting is when you compost something. So you're actually making something else out of it. You're making more material for bringing back into the system. And if you want to do a more activism streak into it, it's refusing. That can be something difficult to do, but it's saying, no, I don't want that product. Saying why you don't want it and using your voice to hopefully change the minds of others. So hopefully I've changed your mind a little about waste and responsibility about waste, or at least got you thinking over this lunch break. So thanks very much. Thanks, Elaine. Um, that was a really eye-opening presentation. Um, so we'll go through if we've any questions now. Um, we'll just give people a sec to write them in. Um, so we have a question here from Finbar. Um, so he says, as one of the organizers of a clean coast group, 
I can very much echo your comments on plastic bottles, baby wipes and takeaway cups and spoons that can't be recycled as they're the most common thing we collect. I would agree that it is a, it is a shared responsibility. So um, not a comment, uh, not a question, just a comment. Um, One of the different uh, things, Fenbury, that you'll know is that if, even if you're collecting waste on the beach that can be recycled, Unfortunately, it doesn't end up getting recycled because there's another number of steps that need to be involved that it would have to be cleaned thoroughly before it can be recycled. So, um, which is always a pity because it shouldn't be there in the first place. But um, that's brilliant to know that you're one of the, that you're a member of a clean coast group. Do we have any other questions for Elaine? Um, so we have a question here from Avian. She says, any advice on what we can do for Plastic Free July to help with our waste? So I know that, um, and I haven't been working on it, I know Clean Coast are doing a lot for Plastic Free July. I did a project on it a couple of years ago. Um, it was with Gal Galway County Council, we were doing it at the time for a Plastic free, free Week in February. And what I found for me was the easiest was to bite size. So look at what you're doing already in your life to be a little more plastic free. And there's some things that you're very possibly doing with the likes of the coffee cups, reusable bottles. And I think it's trying not to overwhelm yourself with being completely plastic free. Plastic isn't, it's, it's not bad, it's not evil. It's a really good product, but we need to look at the way we're using it. And I think for Plastic Free July, if you challenge yourself to reduce the amount of plastic and maybe go room by room because if you look at it too much it can be very overwhelming so I think start small and work up and then you're more likely to bring that into past July into August September and into next July. And we have one other question from Jonathan um, how do we collectively influence at policy level do you have any thoughts on this? This is always a difficult one, obviously, but um, it's engaging with local lobbying or activist activism groups. So I know within Clean Coast, what we do is we work on with community groups, so we don't work on that side of it. But there are plenty of groups that do and work and more or work and more influencing policy. Get to know your local councillors. Get to know your local politicians, the people that can have a voice, and go to them with logical solutions because obviously we're not going to change everything overnight i'm a big believer in swimming with the stream and then coming out of it slowly like you'd get out of a riptide if you work with the system i think you have more power and then start veering off and moving people a little bit at a time i think that can work but i think it is pen to paper getting onto your councillors getting onto your politicians and just using them and just pushing them to use their voice as, or use your voice as their voice to get things changed because we do know there is a problem. And one of the good things is, and the amazing David Attenborough uh, with, with um, Blue Planet has created the Blue Planet effect that much more countries and a lot of islands are doing it, a lot of countries are doing it, are reducing single use plastic and that is making a massive difference. So. The fact that it's kind of trendy at the moment, I think we ride in that wave and keep going with that. Okay, and we have another question from Finbar. Um, he said that I saw a news story on the journal this morning that over 30% of all plastic exported from Europe is not, is not recycled. Would you know if there's any particular type of plastic that this happens to the most? I know I've heard that on a number of occasions. Yeah, that, all, not all the plastic we use is recycled. And I don't have it in front of me, but you know, you have your number one to number six, the plastics, and not all of them are recyclable. And it does say, kind of annoyingly though, and a lot of Aldi and Little tend to do it, just saying, not yet recyclable. But it doesn't really help you to know, is that the entire packet or is that just some of it? So it is a bit more complex, but I think, all right, when I think I know, that I've contacted my own waste company before to find out what they are recycling, what they are accepting. Because you can put your recycling in the bin and you put your plastics in the bin and you think, great, 
all this is going to be recycled. And it's very disheartening to find out that some of it ends up in landfill. But at least if you know from your own waste provider, just some answers about what they actually are recycling. Because obviously we're not doing it in, um, on this island, but there is a problem with some plastics having mixed types of plastics in the one container. And I can't fully remember now, but I think it's the higher numbers, some of them, we're just not able to recycle them yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a question from Maeve. So um, she says, it's not the best time to try and change behavior for single use cleaning materials due to COVID, but do you think we could try and reverse our growing dependency upon wipes? Yeah, so I'm working on a project at the moment and we've been kind of putting it together for a while saying, we don't want to tell people what to do and we're in a very odd time but we're coming out of it a small bit more and again it's not telling people not to use wipes because some people find them handy to use but it's just getting people to think to take a breath think is there an alternative and there is you can use a cleaner and a cloth and i think that comes with a little bit of time but at the moment i think and hopefully if things continue to go well people will start to breathe and think a bit more and maybe not act in the fashion that we have been acting for the last three months, which is very understandable. But the only thing I think, the only kind of bright thing, I think the people maybe that are using massive amounts of wipes now are not going to be using them in a year's time because our world will be very likely a slightly different place. So I think while it's not good, it is a temporary measure for a lot of people. Um, thanks, Elaine. Um, we have a um, comment from Saline, um, just in relation to the last point about plastic and what can be recycled and what waste companies will accept. She said to check out mywaste.ie, which is the national waste guide funded by the Department of the Environment. So thanks for that, Saline. Um, and there's a comment from Emma. How do you think we can best influence supermarkets to reduce their plastic packaging? And how can we all try to reduce our purchasing of plastics from supermarkets? So supermarkets is always a big one. And I worked with uh, Food Cloud and I had talked to them about it, um, saying about the plastic packaging. Sometimes there's a reason for plastic packaging. One of the unfortunate things is we import a lot of our food and we like getting kiwis we like getting strawberries out of season we like getting these kind of foods they're going to have to have packaging on them because they've come from so far away that's the way to preserve them there is another area that you're looking at food waste versus plastic waste the plastic can often preserve the food a little bit longer but if so you're preventing food waste that's not that it's an answer but it's just that these things aren't always as simple um, it's thinking in the supermarket, taking time to think. You see bananas. Again, bananas have traveled halfway around the world, so we don't necessarily need them. But I know in my house, we eat an awful lot of bananas. You can just pick the ones without the, without the plastic packaging. It's very easy to do that because you can pick them up. We don't need the bags. If you're more inclined, then you can get into the refusing or saying it. There's no point saying it to the teller because it's not very fair. That person is earning minimum wage. They don't have the massive influence. It's going higher up within the supermarket, looking for either a manager or getting onto a higher level when you're ringing or, um, ringing or writing to them and saying, I'm not going to shop with you anymore unless you reduce your packaging. What are you doing about packaging? Why do you have so much packaging? Or what some people do is they take their products out of the packaging and leave the, leave the packaging there in the, in the supermarket and say, you deal with it. I don't want to be dealing with it. It takes a particular type of person to do that, but that's another way of looking at it. You could make it as a little bit of louder activism or a bit of quieter activism by contacting the um, company themselves because they do listen to people because they're their customers. And you might think I'm only one voice. It's only one letter. It's only one call you're not the only person there's a lot of people doing it and that kind of people power can make a difference um, okay so uh, whites seem to be the hot topic so we've one final question from angelique 
and she's just asking, do you not think that the problem with the wife issue is because there's not enough information for people to know what alternative they can use? Okay, and that, that's very interesting because it's something I was talking about earlier at work saying we're, we're in depth in this environmental issue and sometimes you don't think about what, you know, what the other questions are. And I've got two small kids. We use wipes a lot. And I know there's alternatives that I could make them. And I'm always saying I'll do it. And again, the life of convenience takes over. So you're, you're right. The convenient, is, the convenient product is there and it's cheap. So a, you tend to pick it up and go with it and sometimes not thinking. But as I said earlier, if you're lucky enough to have grandparents or relations that were around, especially in wartime, they're going to be a mine of knowledge for what was life like before wipes? What was life like before you used so much plastic? A lot of the things that you would be using instead of a wipe, it's a cloth that you have to clean. And I think the alternative wipes is generally a cloth. And it's messier, there's more cleaning in it, it's not as easy to use, and it's not something you can just do the wipe and throw away, so there's a bit more work in it. But um, it's something I'll definitely look into more about the alternatives for each type of wipe to put a resource together for that, because I think that's something that could be very useful. Brilliant, thanks very much, Elaine. And um, that was a great Q&A. And um, so that concludes the episode of this week's webinar and next week's episode will be with Pat Kennedy who's the Managing Director of eTowns and his webinar will be on a proposal for a smarter approach to community management. Um, so thanks again for everyone joining us and thank you Elaine. Thanks very much and thanks for logging in. <laughs>